What better you are open and welcoming to disabled customers than having a wheelchair in your window. That's the thinking behind a wheelchair for mannequins, the Maniquil, which was designed by Britain's Sophie Morgan and displayed in some very prominent shop windows during the London Paralympic Games in 2012. She saw the chair as not just a symbol of inclusivity, but a chance for businesses to get a bigger slice of a significant consumer market. The BBC's Laura Westbrook went to meet her to talk hearts and minds minds and wallets. I had a car crash when I was 18 and that's why I now use a wheelchair. I thought about the wheelchair as a symbol of disability and that really became my reference point and I just drew lots of different types of chairs. That's when I decided that that was the product that I wanted to, to develop. The Maniquil is more than just a wheelchair in a window with a mannequin on it. For me, it's first and foremost, it's a, it's a symbol of inclusivity. It's a sign that the shop that has put this chair in its window is saying, people with disabilities are welcome here. We've considered them and we know what their needs are. I was successful in getting it into a couple of retailers on the high street. I had three chairs in a high street shop on Oxford Street in London. I was so over the moon. But the minute the game's finished, the chairs came out, and I was quite shocked. I thought, well, does that mean that there's no disabled people anymore? What, what's going on? I was really disheartened. The challenge for me really is to prove that there is not only a reason to do this from a sort of socially responsible position, there's also a value in doing this because you're going to open up your business to an enormous demographic of people. We have a spending power. People know that there needs to be better representation. You see it with plus size models, you see it with models of different colour and it's and size and so why uh, why isn't the disabled body at represented at all and that's that needs to happen you know yesterday <laughs> my challenge is to not only to get them by the heart but also get them by the mind and actually show them by the wallet more likely <laughs> that they can make money from communicating with not only me as a disabled person but my family and you get that sort of brand loyalty that comes from it um, but also that it's a good thing to do and it helps people who have disabilities feel more welcome and included. Well, I'm joined by Laura Westbrook, who produced that report, and Rosemary Fraser, who's a disability campaigner. Rosemary, you realised, you were just saying to me, that you know Sophie. Yeah. What do you make of her efforts to try to get more visibility in this way? I think it's really, really great. We've discussed on Twitter this issue around not being able to kind of get access to, uh, to the various stories that we like. And what I particularly like about this is that a disabled person has, well, here's a problem here I'm going to solve it and they have thought about it and they've just gone ahead and produced something and, and this is great because you know as she, as, as she said in the report you know we were very visible during the Paralympics and then boom London we're not there anymore and of course we're still here but and so it's things like this that hopefully will make people think without it sort of being sort of too much kind of uh, kind of you know sort of telling people what to do but they'll just kind of see this and think okay it's yeah. a great nudge isn't it yeah, and Laura absolutely. I know you've been researching mm -hmm whether other British companies are looking to try to be more welcoming, give more access to disabled consumers? Yeah, I mean, what is so, I think, important to, to, to bring out here is the spending power of uh, disabled people worldwide is um, a market share of China. And we're also talking about 80% of those people are of working age. So this is a huge untapped potential that um, businesses could be tapping into. And, you know, when I was filming that report with Sophie, we were walking down the high street and we saw that mannequins are mainly standing up. So so businesses are, you know, not really engaging with the disabled consumers. They can maybe get into the shops, but when they're there, they're not being engaged with. But some are now kind of waking up to that. And Marks and Spencer's is quite a good example of that. Um, 
this uh, woman rang up and said that she couldn't buy clothes for her disabled son. And Marks and Spencers responded with that by making, bringing out a range of larger clothes to fit children with disabilities. And they actually found that this um, reduced their costs and reduced their prices. So it was beneficially from a business sense. Mm -hmm. And Rosemary, that's important, isn't it? We're not just talking about the mannequins, but what's on them. Absolutely. And if you're talking about fashion as well, yeah. that's a massive industry. <coughs> Absolutely. And the, the thing that... I get frustrated by is that people think that we're somehow different or other. I'm a shopaholic, as my husband will attest to. <laughs> I love shopping. Um, and, you know, if I go into a store and it's not set out right or I can't reach things, I'm just going to leave. If I'm, I have a busy lunchtime, I haven't got time to wait for that help and things. And, and you just want to go in there and you just want to, you just kind of want to uh, kind of pick up something and go. And I think, you know, um, people really need to think about this, about how they're marketing to me because I spend a lot of money, too much money on clothes and, and things. And it's the purple pound, a phrase Absolutely, that you've purple used. pound, right. yeah. yeah to, you know, that's a huge amount of money. But also, it's not just that. If I don't shop there, my friends don't shop there. You know, my, my husband doesn't go in there. So it's, it's, it's a knock-on effect. Because you're an influencer things. as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. You're a shopaholic, you're an influencer. Absolutely. And word of mouth, the is, word. Word of mouth is, is, is the best marketing. It's also the most harmful marketing because if I've had a bad experience, people will hear about it. You mentioned, Rosemary, that during the Paralympics, visibility was obviously mm -hmm. much, much better. And Laura, in your research, you found that too, didn't you? The drop-off afterwards was pretty sudden. I mean, Sophie found that with the Man Equal. Uh, she got it into a shop during the Paralympics, and then it finished, and uh, they pulled it. And uh, another example of businesses that w did really well by engaging with the disabled consumer was uh, Maltesers. They brought out a series of three adverts using disabled ad uh, actors. One of them, which was actually my favourite, was um, just three girls chatting and it's not till the end that you see that one of them uses a wheelchair and it did divide opinion but it was a great example of inclusion rather than showing the differences and uh, I think that's what um, businesses are not harnessing at the moment. Now, um, we're sitting in what is a big cultural institution, the BBC. It's a big public service organisation. And I know that yesterday, actually, BBC News said it wanted to do more to bring in journalists with disabilities. Give us a bit more of an idea, Laura, of what the aim is here. Yeah, um, so they're um, opening it up to 12 journalists, um, which are uh, they're going to recruit um, from this fund of about a, um, a million pounds. And um, they're going to be from, uh, from positions from a uh, journalist to an assistant an editor and all of these positions are going to be on online and social platforms and uh, you know this is going to be a mentoring scheme and uh, it's if you're not if you don't get those 12 positions they're opening it up to um, a pool of people so you know if people don't actually get it they, they're in they're in a pool of people and it's all part of the BBC's commitment to diversity. Rosemary what do you think of that I mean 12 positions doesn't sound very much I suppose it's the the intention and getting people into influential positions that's I, going to I matter. Think, I think so. I think there's certain professions uh, in which disabled people are simply not there. Um, my first job on graduating uh, from university was at the BBC, was with the BBC. Right. So I was incredibly lucky and I know how having that on my CV was useful for me in, in uh, subsequent years. And to, you know, journalism, because you're telling the story, you are, you know, you, you, you're, you set the tone for how disability is talked about. And if you're a disabled person yourself and you have that lived experience, that makes such a difference. And, and I, I certainly have told many of my friends who are interested in uh, a career in journalism to look at this because the normal routes maybe just aren't open to you through the kind of local newspapers. Uh, that maybe just isn't, isn't applicable if you have a certain type of impairment. So I think this is really good. But it's also, Rosemary, just like you were saying, it's not, I'm not a disabled consumer, I'm a consumer. Yeah, exactly. You know, you'd be a journalist. Absolutely. I mean, I mean yeah. it, it's, it's about a, a completely diverse workforce looking at all stories. Absolutely. And, and one of the things I love about disabled people is that because we exist in a kind of largely hostile built environment, we're fixers. We solve things. And you're, you're then going to bring a different, a different take, perhaps, to a news story because you're used to kind of maybe seeing the world in a different way. Um, and I think that can only be, you know, a great thing for the, for the BBC and, and how they go forward with their stories. Yeah, and our audiences, they want to see people that are like them yeah. as well, yeah. you know, so that reflects, the workforce reflects what you see on TV. So Absolutely. if you see someone like you, then you're, you're more involved in the story, aren't That's you? Right. Well, let's bring it back to Sophie at the end of our conversation. Do you think, Laura, having talked to her at length during your research 
that she feels optimistic. She feels very optimistic. It was really interesting talking to her because she was, she was quite disheartened um, after the Paralympics. But she believes, and we were talking about this before the interview as well, that now is the time. People are now more aware of um, disabled consumers and, and they're aware that there is a spending power here, there's a value there. And although as yet it may be unharnessed, there's a huge amount of potential. Yeah. Definitely, I think it's definitely the time is there. You know, we've got all kinds of uh, sort of different um, technologies coming together now to enhance um, the lives of disabled people and it's kind of getting people in the, in the same room that kind of wouldn't normally think about disability issues. We see that with, uh, with sporting excellence, you know, on how the kind of development of the blade, for example, has helped runners. That can help in so many different ways. And this is why it was great to see Sophie producing this and, you know, just kind of getting people together and thinking about this. It's great to talk about it with you both. We have to leave it there, but Laura and Rosemary, thanks very much.